I've done a number of videos in the past about diamond distribution and kind of what they mean to comics and often into some details. I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about what is the point of a distributor completely. And to do that, uh, I had a, a person who was really helpful, who was able to provide some information from the inside from when they worked at diamond. We're going to talk a little bit about what purpose they serve, why they do what they do, and just a look inside the company. I think you're really going to love this. Hey everybody, this is Perch. Um, talking about diamond distribution, it's one of those things that if you aren't involved in in that part of the world, it often it probably feels kind of magical and just strange, uh, like this this very hard thing to kind of wrap your head around. Uh, but the reality is, a lot of parts of, of distribution are are very standard uh, in many different places in the world, and diamonds no exception to these. Like I mentioned, uh, I had somebody reach out to me who was a former employee of Diamond who said I'd, I'd really love to come in and give some some good data about what it's like there, you know, the good parts, the bad parts, the problems, but also kind of to set the record straight on some of, of, of the product. So with a couple disclaimers, just very quickly, obviously this is uh, one person's viewpoint, not, you know, a, a source, you know, an, an amalgamation of 30 people. And also, uh, you know, the, the person has been away from Diamond for a little while, so things could have changed somewhat. So just ground yourself with that bit of data, but I still think it's, it's really helpful. So I'm going to read a lot of what what he wrote for me. You know, obviously we don't get to get anybody in trouble, so you know I'm, I'm transcribing for you. But first off, you know, what is a distributor? I, we throw this word around a lot. What does it actually mean for comics? Well, depending on the industry, distributors work in a variety of ways. In Diamond's case, it's not just like a warehouse full of comics and toys shipped out to retailers. They work as a one-stop shop for everything. This individual says, "I worked in customer service and sales, the front line." people who take care of the reordering and issues that arise on any given day. As you know, by the way, from Diamond, this is a place of high controversy. The sales department is just that. They call their client base, they offer them products which generally change weekly depending on what's being offered. The credit department take care of all the money for the various comic shops, paying invoices, collecting monies owned, etc., incoming and outgoing. Then there's the marketing group that basically puts out the giant previews book each and every month. They get the solicitations from all the various product departments, comics, toys, games, posters, apparel, etc., and they put that book together. The product departments work mostly with the vendors to get those solicitations. So it's way more than just shipping out comic books for warehouse. There's a lot of moving parts. So some commentary on that before we move on with this is statement. This is a, a big area where people, I think, get confused of what Diamond does. They kind of picture it in their minds like, there's a, a bunch of cubicles kind of in one tiny little room and then a giant warehouse with boxes. And then the people go into the warehouse and they take a box from location A and put it in a truck and, and that's what they do. But obviously, they are far more of an internal cog uh, to this entire system. Uh, they are also involved in the solicitations, as a gentleman mentioned. They're involved in, in finance and getting money in and paying it out. And they're really part of this, this what, what we call the supply chain. So from somebody who kind of dreams up a comic idea, you know, sells it, gets made, gets produced, Diamond steps in to help help basically bring it to life, get it to where it needs to be, collect all the monies involved, get it promoted, marketed, and so on. So as we talk about, by the way, marketing in comics, Diamond is an important piece of this. That's something we often miss. We, we talk, uh, I in particular, talk a lot about the publishers and miss, the, miss uh, mentioning the fact that Diamond has a big role to play as well. So we go on here. Um, I asked some questions, basically, and this guy was really helpful in filling out some answers. What groups work with the comic shops? Well, customer service and sales work with comic shops pretty much all the time. When I was there, each customer service rep had a select client base they worked with, so they were able to hopefully build a relationship with their shops. They always had the option to just go into the queue if they wanted because there are certain shops that didn't like their assigned rep. Salespeople had the same type of base, but they'd call out to the shops for ongoing sales attempts. The credit folks handle the shop bills, not the easiest job. Okay, pause here for a second. Um, you know, what we mean by an assigned rep? So this is kind of identified what he just said, but basically at Diamond, there's somebody who has a several accounts, accounts being shops. And their job is to make sure things are going well, that if the shop had a problem, they could call in. They didn't go to kind of some mindless 800 number. They would call Bob. 
you know, and Bob would then be kind of on track to, to get their issue resolved. I'll continue here with the, the gentleman's statement. I mean, without the shops, there'd be no business. But I often got the impression at times Diamond hated the shops as much as the shops hated Diamond. There were certainly shops that weren't thought of very highly and were considered problems, but never did I get the impression that comic shops were important more as a necessary evil. It's crazy to consider that being the case, but it was very true, at least during my time. And here's where I'll pause again. And, and if you look at some of the comments from Glassdoor and other places, and also what you see on retailer forums and in Facebook, I, this, this is an attitude that has per, prevailed. Kind of on all fronts. The comic shops irritated with Diamond for what they do. Diamond at times irritated with comic shops for making noise or paying late or you know not you know being being behind and and kind of this. It was definitely a a love hate relationship. But in this case, the love part may be kind of shaky. So kind of a dependency hate relationship <laughs> may be a better way to put it. But that's that's probably the biggest dynamic when you talk about Diamond and comic shops is exactly this 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 feeling of. Of uh, you know, both sides kind of wish the other would go away at various times, but knows that it can't. So we're going to continue modernization. I ask the question: How is Diamond modernizing? Because it's another thing you often see them get dinged with, and they say modernization and Diamond didn't exist in the same world. When I was there, the ordering system was kind of a DOS-based program. DOS being a, a very, <laughs> very old <laughs> system. There's there's people who are techies right now who are cringing just hearing this word. Anyway, it was a DOS-based program called MCBA. If you told me today that it was still being used, I wouldn't be surprised. Sales is done out of an Access database. Access being one of the, the, the products that Microsoft used to have in their office suite, the one nobody liked to use that really has disappeared uh, today. Uh, the issue is there really aren't people working there that create new systems. The IT people at the time were basically just there to support the existing systems. Not once was a new system created during my tenure. There are so many good customer service tracking systems out there, but even that was outdated at the time. I'd venture that once Diamond does make a decision to modernize, what they would choose would already be outdated. There really is no innovation there because it's basically a don't spend if you don't have to kind of environment. Are they cheap? Yeah, you could say that. So to be fair, by the way, to Diamond, a lot of distributors and a lot of people are in the same boat because there's a, there's a term in technology called tech debt. And I realize I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but tech debt is basically something where we say, we don't have the time or the money to fix this now, so we'll do it later. And this is considered debt. And over time, the longer and longer you put off that tech debt, the bigger it grows and builds up until you know something that might have cost a thousand dollars and you know two hours worth of time to fix now might take four to five weeks because as time goes by systems get older dependencies get bigger and it just becomes bigger and you know a bigger bigger mess to solve your problem almost every single company under the sun including tech companies uh have the same kind of uh, love hate or hate hate relationship in times with it it is considered a necessary evil it is not bringing in money but people know IT is necessary to keep the systems up and running so they can collect money. But it creates this challenge where people don't want to invest in IT. They just they, they don't want to do it because it's not bringing them an easy return. If you're a new manager coming into a company and you recommend, hey, I want to invest a lot of money into IT, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a quick way to get fired, as people say, because you are incurring cost for the company without clear return. Now, if you're clever and good about it, you can paint a picture of saying, here's why investing in IT today saves us money down the road, but that's often a very hard thing to do. That's a very, that's a very complex argument to make. It's often much easier to make a simpler argument like, let's raise our prices. But anyway, relationships with the publishers. So the gentleman writes, I know the CS people, customer service people, didn't have much of any relationship with publishers. The product department would work directly with them to get their monthly solicitations together. They'd also spend quite a bit of time trying to sell their own properties to the publishers. It's kind of a conflict of interest, really, when some of your sales guys are also creating content for the publishers that they're making money off of. So for example, if the product guy is selling Battlestar Galactia, also wrote Battlestar Galactia, it's more likely going to get a prominent spot in the previews book. As for other groups, there wasn't a lot of direct contact with publishers, but samples would come through that they could see, and there'd occasionally be people to come in and present new products. That was about it. This checks out, by the way. I think, in general, uh, at Diamond, you did see a, a definite uh, disconnect at times between uh, the publishers and the entire organization. And, and I think, you know, maybe not the most unusual thing to have happened, but it's interesting to, to hear that perspective. Uh, other partners. So who else is involved? We talk about Diamond, but there's other people involved too, right? Who are they? 
So Joman writes, Diamond likes to do most of it themselves, but in terms of shipping, UPS was always a preferred shipper of choice. It presented a problem when I was there when they went on strike, meaning UPS, and I'm sure with the pandemic going on now and UPS being somewhat slower, it's an issue today. When they went on strike, they were using whatever they could to get the books out. FedEx was overwhelmed, so there was a U.S. mail and whatever courier service they can get. Heck, they were even using Greyhound bus to certain locations. It was a mess, and they didn't really have a business opportunity plan for anything like that. The only thing that would be printed would be previews, and I'm really not sure how that was done. So this is an interesting comment because here's an area where Diamond does find themselves, I think, behind the eight ball at times. They're, they For everything that they do, they get to be at the mercy, in some cases, of shippers. So if UPS is doing terrible... Diamond is going to do terrible. Um, and that's that's one of those areas where because of just the nature of being a distributor and getting your product from point A to point B, you are going to rely on others. And those others are not the most reliable in the industry um, overall. So that's a question about damaged comics. Uh, and he writes, this has been an issue forever, hasn't it? Well, here's the thing. When you pack hundreds of comics into a box and send them across the country in planes and trucks, damages are going to happen. Some shops expect every comic they receive to be pristine. With how they're handled and delivered, that's unreasonable. Now, are there times that you could get a run of bad books? Sure, that's always possible, but they shouldn't be shipped out. And things like that can happen when you're grabbing stacks at a time. Comics aren't really worth much anymore in terms of collectability, at least in today's market. So needing everything mint just isn't realistic. This is, again, an interesting point. You may, by the way, there may be some people listening to this who really object to that paragraph, but um, it is a reality. I think when you're shipping things around, um, it's going to be, you know, damages are going to be, uh, they're going to happen. And I think if you really sat down with people and, um, and tried to pull it back, the issue with Dime is not that I get bad product. I mean, it becomes that way over time if it's always coming in bad, but more what happens when it is bad? What happens when it comes damaged? What's the recourse? What's the fix? And I think that's the area where you can more accurately pinpoint uh, what's Diamond doing or not doing in this case. Um, in terms of uh, so, in terms of stability and growth, I asked a question like, "How stable? What's the feeling inside of Diamond at the time? How stable they were? How they were growing? Did they? Did people feel like their jobs were secure?" He writes, "I never really got the sense back then that Diamond wasn't stable." But things change as the economy changes. The problem I saw is that with the superhero movie boom that occurred, Diamond should have had some major growth opportunities to put them in a better economical position. I don't really think that happened. As for internal growth, it just isn't there. There are people working the same positions they've been in for decades. There really isn't anywhere to go. And like I said, unless you're one of the chosen ones, you weren't going to go anywhere anyway. We're going to get into culture in a moment, but that's kind of another major factor. If you want a company that's vibrant and alive, there needs to be a feeling inside that there are promotion opportunities. There is an ability to kind of come in an entry level and build up. It's baked into our DNA as people. We want to succeed. We want to grow. So I asked a question about culture. What's a culture like? How is it? Because if you read those glass door reviews, if you read anything, there's, there's a very kind of dismal view of the workers as they describe their own positions within Diamond. So I said, what's a culture like? How, how are people happy to work there? Is, are they innovating? If you have a happy workforce, if you have people that are really feel engaged and, and respected by their company, they typically will you know, lean forward and do a lot more to kind of help the company. So the question becomes culture, and, uh, and he responds, now this is an interesting question, because I've seen so many comments about workers being underpaid and management not being the best. I will say the underpaid comments are correct. I guess it's fine if you're single and young without much responsibility, but if you have a family and a house, a salary at Diamond just isn't going to pay the bills. It was terrible then, and from what I hear, it's terrible now. But if you're in upper management, you're taken care of. The front line would be in small cubes with not a lot of room, while the senior leaders would have huge offices with beautiful wood furniture and displays. It was like two different companies. The senior leaders would rarely see the front line, to be honest. It's very clicky, too. So if you're not in with the right group, you're not long for the company. Since leaving there and being a real business environment, I'd go as far as to say they don't really know at all about how a real 21st century business works. For example, I remember a customer service rep once being told on their review that they were odd. How is that appropriate? Another rep basically spent his time hacking into the company system, which wasn't discovered nearly fast enough. One time a rep dried his weed in the microwave. <laughs> Just crazy stuff. I can't say how it is now, but back then it was a circus almost daily. Um, unfortunately, this is a uh, culture. I mean, you can easily kind of take the diamond out of it and apply it to 
50% or more companies. This goes on everywhere, and we're hearing about it more and more and more. Um, I laughed at the guy drying his weed in the microwave because uh, I worked at a company briefly that the that, that guy would both dry his weed in the microwave, and then it seemed like if, if you let culture go for a while, if you let these kind of rules go, people then eventually just tip into doing clearly wrong things. So this guy was drying it there, and then you take it home and, in theory, smoke it. Um, and then at some point, nobody was commenting, nobody's calling the guy out for doing this. And so then he decided to just, you know, he would go into the parking lot and just light up. And then at some point he just, uh, you know, we were working late one day and he just lit up his desk. So it's like, if you let these things go, people will just push it further and further. Um, the dynamic around the workers and the senior management, I mean, is a, is a tale as old as time. And unfortunately, it's, it's sad to hear that, you know, this is the case there, but it also fits as you, as you look at the company and you see the discrepancy maybe between how things are getting done on the floor versus how the company is presenting itself at the, at the management level. Definitely, there seems to be just some disconnects. And those disconnects are dangerous. Uh, when they exist for a long time, uh, the company gets more and more, uh, you know, problematic in the, in the sense that uh, issues aren't treated well, workers start misbehaving in kind of strange ways out on the floor. And, and so it, it can definitely create some, some toxic things. The idea about clicks and growth, I mean, man, we've been talking about networks within comics forever. Well, you know, here's Diamond, a group that's attached to comics. And here we are again with networks and clicks and different groups you have to be a part of in your job to succeed. And it's true everywhere in the country. It's just, you really it kind of hammers at home that that you can't get away from it. You're playing politics always. Uh, finally, asked one last question of competition. And he notes, there was never any concern about competition back then because there wasn't any. The problem with a monopoly is it breeds complacency, hence the lack of willingness to evolve or even pay their employees more money. If you're in that industry, where are you going to go? I think the issues with DC Comics they're having now is a long time coming. Diamond bent over backwards for DC with them having their own personal go-to person. When Marvel came back, DC wasn't thrilled, but they still weren't considered the number one property until they weren't. Uh, they, sorry, they were still considered the number one property until they weren't. I think, and we'll talk about that in a second, I think Diamond will have to learn some very valuable lessons in the coming months and years. The industry is changing, and that's not something they're ever very good at. Change. And that's everything that I got. Really some, some great comments here. A bit on that DC Comics note, I think that this is probably why you see a lot of people taking extremely personal uh, at Diamond and at some of the shops is that DC did have this this belief or, or this um, not belief they had this status within Diamond that they were the most important company even when they weren't the one bringing in the most money they they had that legacy kind of moment and so them leaving I'm sure feels like for those who've been in the company a long time a true betrayal because they they have been treated um, in theory very very highly but like any relationship just having your own go to person. Uh, is one thing, but was the company being proactive about actually doing the right things to protect their business, modernize, and, and do the right things? Clearly, the answer was no. So it's an interesting dynamic uh, back and forth that you see here. But uh, you know, I, I think competition hopefully breeds better things, but if it goes too long, kind of like that tech, tech debt statement earlier, uh, it can be very hard to get back in the saddle again and, and really run your business uh, in a competitive way. And, and the question is, you know, has has Diamond forgotten how to do that? So anyway, I, I, I hope that this was helpful for you. It's, it's wonderful to get these comments from inside. Thank you very much uh, to the gentleman who, who provided these, these pieces. I think it's really informative, and, and I hope you all really enjoyed this, got some good data out of it. Again, like I said at the beginning, this is one person's view, and, and he notes that as well. One person's view, and uh, there's there's certainly different experiences always. And uh, he notes that you know he he's been with, gone from the company for a while, so maybe some things are different. So your mileage may vary, but all the same, um, I think really great data, good to get this perspective. And I'm going to continue to look for other ways to uh, give you that perspective. Do you have any questions on all this? Um, uh, let me know your thoughts, your questions, your your observations. If there's an opportunity to go back and get some additional data, I will I will go back to them and, and see what I can do. But otherwise, um, I hope this was helpful. Um, like, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, follow me on social media or, or send me an email if you want some privacy at uh, comicsperch at gmail.com. And thanks for listening.